people compare us and I, I do remember when Bucky's and Victor were playing and Victor would always be like, oh, he's the brawn, I'm the brain. And I go back to what I, what I was lucky enough to be given as a young player. Um, the first thing was, I was told in the 2011 World Cup, don't read the paper. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, oh, if you have to read it, just look at the photos and, and then that's it. Granted was left with a big hole in his shin. Yeah. And before every game, he put a, a piece of wood in, in the hole. A piece of wood? And he'd put a shin guard, I don't know what it looked like, and he'd tape it over, pull his sock up and go in and play. I can listen to um, a podcast on the way down, the kind of Centurions podcast. Can you remind, or, or in your own words, going to go through again the story of how your father obviously played for the All Blacks, but his kind of war exploits in the old Second World War? It's just yeah, not everyone's got I was, I was like a little bit worried about what story you were after. There, I was, <laughs> I was, well, you can we have got a mic on a few things, but yeah, no, it's a um, So the, the story goes, and as stories goes, there's always bits left out and, yes, and added in, but. So Grandad was was on the boat going to the war. Um, they were lined up in threes. Uh, Grandad was in the middle. Uh, a, a bomb or shell hit the boat, uh, killed a, one of his mates standing next to him. Uh, Grandad had a, a mangled leg, and the person next to him had not a scratch. Yeah. So Grandad swore was over before it started. Yeah. Um, was, was sent home, um, and then had a massive hole in his leg, and they were going to amputate it, and they. The surgeon at the time uh, didn't know that Grandad was an up-and-coming rugby player mm -hmm. and they did everything they could to, to keep it, but Grandad was left with a big hole in his shin yeah. and before every game he put a, a piece of wood in, in the hole. A piece of wood? And he'd put a shin guard, I don't know what it looked like, and he'd tape it over, pull his sock up and go in and play. Um, and that, that was Grandad's war story and he made the All Blacks uh, in 53-54 came over here and, and played um, through that time and yeah. he was actually the oldest member of the team and his nickname was Dad and a few of the younger boys have been teasing me about my age because Dane Coles is not here. Oh, and baby at FIFA. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, yeah, that's um, as the story goes and Mum always tells stories about he'd have all the shrapnel that would come to the surface in his hand and go in once a year and get all that out and it's kind of the, the story of of the time, like every rugby player had a connection to the war or the connection to to rugby, but that's that's how Grandad played and that's what it was. Yeah, what I said, and I think Richie's, was Richie's grandfather a fighter in the, kind of in the World War Two. so you've got a few kind of war yeah. stories that you can kind of... Yeah, and it, it's something, um, last week we had the privilege of playing with the poppy on our, on our sleeve, so yeah. it's something that um, we definitely understand and we do make sure as a team that we have um, the history passed on from player to player, from team to team, so that when we are privileged enough to do it, we understand why and, and what it means. I mean, again, and the thing is that's helped you out, and you talk about pressure growing up in a rugby mad country, but you know, there's five million New Zealanders, there's probably just about a thousand, or that's, not, that's a pretty small percentage. Was, did you always, were you always a, a, a big goose, as they say, and you're, you're six, six, eight now? Because that helps, right? If you're five foot six, it probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened. You've got, probably yeah. got a sizable family. Um, I think at the start, we all played different positions. Uh, my three brothers, they all actually started in the backs. Yeah. Uh, brother was on the wing. Um, I think a couple of them played first five for a while, and then three of us ended up in the forwards. But for me, I was always, hey, you're going to be in the forwards, you're going to be a lock. And I was like, I don't want to play lock. So I kind of tried to play number eight for a while, yeah. played a bit at six, yeah. and kind of got to a stage where I was exactly that, you know, head and shoulders taller than everyone else. Yeah. And they're like, hey, look, we just need you to play <laughs> lock. got no chance of playing it, fly um, off kind of thing. But yeah, yeah. I'm not fly half now. I'm, yeah. I'm sensible, not silly, but um, it, it was always that, always a bit taller than, than my brothers. Yeah. Um, but they've gone on, had su successful careers themselves. Um, you know, all played for our country. So Adam played for the Sevens, and uh, George and Luke have played for the All Blacks at different stages. So yeah. pretty cool to be able to experience this life with them uh, yeah. in different ways. When it comes to leadership, leadership is something that they say some are born with, some learn. You know, you've obviously had. Richie, obviously, you know, worked closely with Sam Kane. You've got Kieran Reid. What does leadership mean to you? What, what, you know, if you were asked to write a thesis on leadership in, in rugby, what, what, what would you say is kind of let's say three pointers and how you lead? I think the first thing that I talk around is actually doing your job well. So, for me as a, a rugby player, 
I've got to go out there and, and play well. And mm. every rugby player has a different job, whether you're a halfback, a lock, or a, an outside back. So for me, I've just got to go out there and play well first. It's easy to lead when you're uh, doing what you need to yeah. do. Yeah. And, and that's probably the, the first step, and a lot of people probably forget that, especially when you're younger. Someone will say, look, we need you to talk more, do this and do that, but mm. the easiest way to lead is through actions. Everyone in your team mm. knows if you're playing well, and all of a sudden what you say has more power because yeah. you're doing that. So that, that's not giving you three, that's yeah. probably the yeah. most important one. So have you at. felt that you've had to, again, if you you know, think as you said, uh, that Richie is pretty shy, um, but is that something you've had to find your voice? Because communication, I coach a load of under-16s, you know, they're too quiet. It's always kind of, you know, talk more, talk more. And when even the pandemic, you saw internationals, the din going on, trying to create that atmosphere. Have, have you found that, that, has that been, always been a, career work on for you when you're kind of speaking to people or addressing them in the change rooms at half time or? Yeah, it's something that I've probably never been shy about voicing my opinion and, and that probably comes from my upbringing. Having three yeah, brothers, if you're shy, you're going to miss out on everything. Yeah. So you kind of got to bully your way in there at times. But um, at the same time, there's always things you can do better. Mm. So it's what you're saying, how you're saying it, you know, your body posture, your language. Yeah. Um, you know, you can say some things that are, you know, stay calm versus don't panic. They're very similar, but at the same time, they're completely different when you're right in the heat of the heat of the moment. So there's things like that that you can always learn and grow and evolve. And that's something that probably, as my career has gone on, I've taken more enjoyment out of right. How do I actually change those one percenters? Something that um, potentially is a strength. Is there something that I can do to make it better, or is there a blind spot that I can? Uh, can grow and evolve with and and that's just not around rugby that's around around life in general so whether it's being a parent being a husband being a brother being a son mm. um, university graduate all those things there's different ways of of doing it and being better at it um, when it comes to you've, you've flown around the world talked about kind of how many caps you've had where where else in the world do you enjoy playing rugby where do you kind of enjoy that rugby culture I mean, i'll come on to japan in a bit but where do you relish going? I saw Aaron Smith said that he loves playing at the Principality Stadium because well, so he's in New Zealand do pretty well there. I think <laughs> if they lost there every time, he wouldn't like it so much. Yeah. But where, where, where do you actually go there and feel a kind of kindred or just even that rivalry that it just kind of sends the hairs in the back of your neck up? It, it's actually really hard to answer that question. And I think if you asked me two years ago, I would have gone Principality, Eden Parks, obviously at home. Um, Ellis Park, you look at Twickenham, I would have gone bang, 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 answered heaps, but I think that's what I enjoy now. Every stadium is so different, whether there's 20,000 there, whether there's 500, which was COVID, yeah. or whether there's 82,000 at Twickenham. So they all have their different feel, and if you just look at the UK sides, mm. you play an island. I've never kicked the ball at the goal in my life, but it's all yeah. deadly quiet, yeah. where you compare that to, say, here. Yeah people were singing different songs. Yeah. You go to Scotland and you got the bagpipes. So yeah. every place, even though you know you border each other, they're all very similar. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that's what makes it so enjoyable is the challenge is there, but the challenge is different. Yeah. And it's the same with the style of games that, that people play. Yeah. Sometimes it, it's wet and cold in a place, so they're more forward yeah. orientated. Sometimes it's Australia, for example, the weather's normally pretty good, so teams want to play expansively, mm -hmm. and um, those challenges are, are pretty cool. So, yeah. Where do you get recognised most? I mean, it would be Paris, Cardiff, London, <sighs> to Tokyo? Um, Hard to go in Kigani to at six foot eight, isn't it? Yeah, well, I'm actually pretty uh, short hair wise and beard wise at the moment, so yeah. it's probably flying under the radar, but um, probably New Zealand, just New Zealand's a, a smaller place, but um, everyone's pretty good. Everyone, sees you with your kids and your family and someone's misbehaving, they leave you alone. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, for one of the kids kicking yeah, off. Yeah. Um, but no, it is really humbling and it's still something that I find really weird because I still see myself as yeah. as me and yeah. people like want to stop and have a yarn and I'm kind of like, this is still weird. So that's something that even though I've played professional rugby for a while, I still find it very, uh, yeah, very different. People actually want to know what you've been up to. Talk about Brody. I know he's getting his 100 cap. This, this interview will probably uh, appear a little bit late in a few, cool. few, a few weeks, a, a month. You know, you've become kind of like two totems, haven't you, for a long, long time, you know, in the, in the, in the engine room for, you know, obviously Scott Barrett's kind of catching up as one, another set, set of brothers. But 
Is he the sort of bloke you think you'll, you know, be in contact with, you know, way after rugby? What what is that kind of relationship like? Yeah, it, it's always interesting. Uh, people compare us, and I, I do remember when Bucky's and Victor were playing, and Victor would always be like, "Oh, he's the brawn, I'm the brain, yeah. good-looking one, or you know, <laughs> the same old rubbish." I'm not going to go down that road at all. Yeah. But Brody and I, our relationship's great. Um, known each other for a long time now. We do spend a little bit of time together away from rugby, but not a heap of time. Um, but where we're both going to end up once rugby's finished, we're going to probably live maybe 25 minutes away from each other. So mm. I'm sure there'll be a few opportunities to catch up and um, you know go over some of the good old times and, yeah. and reminisce. But yeah. um, we spend a lot of time together as it is because we're either playing against each other or we're away with international stuff. and. Um, had a number of weeks, uh, but we haven't actually roomed together a lot. He's probably a little bit messy, so. Um, <laughs> but he, you know, shows up wearing the right thing. So yeah, yeah, well. exactly. Gets there in the end, doesn't he? Yeah. Sort of thing. And this year's kind of it's been a tricky year for New Zealand. Obviously, you've had lost more, you know, four, four games more than you'd usually lose. What what does that has that experience helped you? And you talk about captains around the world who say if. If you lose a game or players and won't open the curtains for three days and don't, and, and don't want to go out, having had so many caps, you know, for the younger guys who maybe haven't experienced kind of those losses, what, how has that helped you kind of show that leadership to, you know, because it's tough, you know, when you've got front pages saying, you know, <laughs> get rid of the coach, you know, the, the, the team are rubbish, how, how do you? Yeah, it's, uh, I go back to what I, what I was lucky enough to be given as a young player. Um, the first thing was, I was told in the 2011 World Cup, don't read the paper. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, oh, if you have to read it, just look at the photos and, and then that's it. And I said, oh, why is that? And they said, well, it's just someone's opinion. And the the world we live in now with social media and things like that, it's actually probably harder to get away from that where a hard physical thing, um, you put it down, you walk away, where everyone carries it around in their pocket at the moment. But I think with that, what I tried to do and what I've always tried to do, win, loss or draw is, look at myself first and play well. And it, it, it sounds simple and it, it might sound selfish, but yeah. if you can do that first, then all of a sudden everything else kind of flows from there. And that's yeah. um, advice that I've been passed on from some outstanding players that have done that really well through their careers. And that's probably one thing that you kind of forget is you're worrying about all these other things, but what is your job? So for me, right, what do I do? Win my line-out ball, make my tackles, carry if I'm asked to do that. All of a sudden, everything else that you do is a, a benefit rather than getting caught up in all the, the external stuff. Now, the last one is, you know, you're going to turn 35 at the World Cup, you know, touch some wood, you know, bod, bod, body willing. You should have passed, you know, or, or passed 150 caps, you'll overtake Richie. Well, what, what goals are left to you? Have you, I know you know answer, but have you even thought about what comes next after the French World, World Cup? Um... Yes and no, like I think it is harder now being away from home, um, especially with the COVID stuff as we talked around because instead of being away for two to three weeks, you're, we were away for six to eight kind of thing. Um, yeah, there's some goals here I'm still pretty keen to achieve and, and, and chasing, but the biggest thing with all of it is you can't get down that road until I deal with, with this week. And I know it's the old cliche, one week at a time, but those cliches are there for a reason. and. There's no point in me saying, oh, you know, I want to get to 150. You've got to do every test match along the way because if you're not playing well from now mm. till then, you're not going to get there. Mm. Um, but once, uh, hopefully finish in New Zealand playing, mm. um, pretty open to most things, but it's not my decision anymore. It's, it's a joint decision with my wife, myself and our kids. So um, that's where it probably changed a little bit from early in your career. Yeah. You know, some of the guys were single, or had partners, but now it's a it's a family decision. Yeah. So is it is the, I mean, can you could you stay away from it? I mean, if you're going to go back to, to farming, do you think you can stay stay away from rugby? Yeah. Um, I think I'll be drawn back it in some way. Um, I've been privileged in, in my career to be um, coached by some amazing people, some amazing coaches, amazing people. Whether that's first 15, whether that's you know, under 10s all the way through to international. So I'd hate to not pass on that knowledge, whether that's to rugby, whether that's to a sport. Um, you know, who knows, I might be coaching my daughter's hockey team at under eights or something. Yeah. Um, but I do know after watching the, the World Cup, I'm not a very good uh, spectator. So, um, 
yeah, it's one of those ones making sure that you can probably have an influence on some on something that you can uh, feel like you have a bit of control. Yeah, better time left anyway.